After a promising start during pre-season testing in Barcelona, where, on the opening day, Lando Norris topped the timesheets, no one could have predicted the challenges that McLaren would face when the 2022 season got underway in Bahrain. Not least, technical director James Key. It was a perfect storm of situations where we were woefully underprepared. We had a problem to fix extremely urgently in a matter of days. It's a really horrible feeling when you're there. There's nothing more uncomfortable than sitting on the pit wall and qualifying and thinking we ain't going to make Q3 here. We've got some work to do. Remarkably, only three races later at Imola, the team turned things around when Lando Norris finished in a sensational third place. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think at that stage we felt we'd made the progress we needed to and probably were where we thought we should be in Bahrain ultimately. And the team doesn't plan on settling there. As racers, we naturally want to finish as high as possible. And I suppose as high as possible is a championship one, isn't it? There's a team here which actually have what it takes to take that next step. Just got to go and face the challenge and I like a challenge. I'm Tom Clarkson and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid. Growing up in the era of Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost, James Key had always dreamt of working in Formula One. More specifically, he dreamt of working for McLaren, the team of his childhood heroes. Fast forward to 2019, and he realized that dream when he became their technical director. While the team was new, the job wasn't. James first became a technical director back in 2005 at the relatively tender age of 33. That was with Midland F1, the team that went on to become Force India. He since worked for Sauber and Toro Rosso, where, back in 2015, he worked alongside the rookie pairing of Carlos Sainz and Max Verstappen. In this episode, James opens up about his 25 years in Formula One, the highs, the lows, some of the drivers he's worked with, and of course, the future for McLaren. I hope you enjoy our conversation. James, welcome to Beyond the Grid. Great to have you on the show. Can we start by talking about the here and now? It's been a bit of a roller coaster for the team in 2022. Are these new cars proving harder to tame than perhaps we all thought? I've definitely got new problems associated with them. I think, you know, we've all seen this porpoising phenomenon. You know, in a way, I suppose, not surprising with a, with a ground effect car. And that's some, um, whilst we've been... I suppose lucky not to suffer from it too badly we've seen others so that's definitely been something new we haven't seen that for a long long time in F1 I don't know if they're harder to tame beyond things like that I think it's more just a massive learning process you know we had no no reference points whatsoever coming into this uh, this season we all worked independently for about two years on these cars because it was obviously delayed for a year after the Covid uh, situation and um had no idea what we'd all find when everyone else turned up. And uh, as it turns out, it's been, you know, a really exciting season so far, I think. But but the roller coaster for us was was a surprise. We we, we started off from a very low point in Bahrain, I think, but then, then rapidly kind of improved the car as we went. How much of a surprise was that Bahrain P14, P15? Because you'd been fastest in Barcelona testing. I mean, it was it was a storm of a, so many different factors. You know, we'd had this this brake issue in the in the test just a week before. That's the closest winter test ever to the first race I think that I can remember. And um, so there was very little time to react to that. But it also meant that testing wise, we got very little done. And not only did that put us on the back foot in terms of learning more about this new car. You know, we'd had three days of winter testing in Barcelona. Um, and that was the first sort of real, real sort of reference point we had. We had another three days to go before the start of the season. We didn't get three days, and what's more, everyone else did. So we went on really went into the race really on the back foot with that. Daniel wasn't available either, unfortunately, because he wasn't well, so he didn't get any driving in that test. So it was a perfect storm of, of situations where we were woefully underprepared. We had a problem to fix extremely urgently in a matter of days between the test and the race. Um, and we hit a track where, where others had really got a lot more mileage than us. We hadn't even done a race distance until that point. So I think a big part of it was the fact that we were just, just behind preparation-wise. Equally, it came as a shock. Yeah, you know, we, we didn't expect to, to struggle quite as much as we did. And um, it was obviously a, a concern, but a, I think most of all a surprise that after such a good Barcelona test, we found ourselves in trouble in the first race. How does it feel when your car 
a machine that you've put so much time and energy into doesn't perform as you'd hoped just any uh, insight there yeah i mean it's a, it's a it's a really horrible feeling when you're there you know there's nothing more uncomfortable than sitting on the pit wall and qualifying and thinking we ain't going to make q3 here guys you know we've we've got some work to do but i have to say the you know and you, it's part of it you know i've been here but i've been here before you know as, as most people have when you haven't had such a good race weekend it's a shame it's the opening race of the season because that's what you used to kind of judge where you're at and what the competition are doing and so on to a certain extent but um yeah it's 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 uncomfortable but we all took i mean i was having i was setting up meetings already on saturday to be honest to to, to run through what happened but we just took it on the chin and thought okay we've got some work to do let's crack on you know there was no pride or protectionism or anything within the team we just recognized we had an issue and uh, let's talk about solutions and that's that's how we faced it you've gone out on a bit of a limb this year with the the pull rod front suspension was there any moment after Bahrain where you were thinking, help, have we gone the right way? Uh, no, I think th- we, we knew that there were downsides mechanically to a pull rod, which is why it's traditionally always been push rod. The other thing with these cars is that they're obviously a lot more ride height sensitive with the floors as well. So the robustness, let's say, of your suspension is extremely important as a result of that. But... Um, we worked hard to mitigate any of the negativities that, that you get from a suspension point of view and pretty much got back to a level which we felt, felt was, was comfortable versus a pushrod suspension. And it was never, there was never any doubt about that. So it wasn't a mechanical issue or an aerodynamic issue with the pull rod. It was a whole combination of things, really. Even the track, actually, the circuit and the conditions on the track were working against us. But um, no, the pull rod wasn't, wasn't the reason why we didn't perform so well. But let's look at let's look at the highlights now. Only a handful of races later, you're on the podium in Imola with Lando Norris. Big smiles down at McLaren as Lando Norris takes another podium in Formula One. A super drive from him this afternoon. P3, P3. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, Woo. purple. How sweet did that moment feel, given everything the team had been through in the preceding weeks? I mean, it was great. You know, I mean, we lucked in a little bit. You know, there was a spinning Ferrari in front of us, I think, which helped us. But we were on a solid P4 up to that point with Lando. Sadly, Daniel had a bit of an incident on the first lap, but otherwise he was looking good in Imola too. So um, I think I think at that stage we felt we'd um, made the progress we needed to and probably were where we thought we should be in, in Bahrain ultimately. But... Um, it, it, it was great to see. I mean, that, that was down to uh, the, the fact that the steps we, we saw, you know, we, we scored points in Saudi Arabia. That would have been two cars had we not had a, uh, a gearbox issue on one of them. We, we were much more competitive in Australia. It was another step again in Imola. It was really good to see that progress. And a lot of that was marginal gains, making up for the lack of the winter test that we had in Bahrain, where we, we would have learned a lot of, about what, of what we learned since the first race in many ways about how best to get um, an optimum set up on the car and how to how to use it and how the drivers to fill it a little bit more etc and it um yeah it just took a a few little logical steps with some some minor mechanical improvements and updates very logical little things some design work in certain areas where we felt uh, we needed to make the car slightly more robust and it, it allowed us to to exploit the car's potential much much better than we did in the first race so fundamentally it was the same car but just with those refinements and tweaks that allowed it to uh, recognise its full potential. You said that Imola time, you were back where you expected to be. I mean, what are the levels of expectation here at McLaren in terms of where you want to finish this season? What What is the message from Zach and Andreas to you in that regard? As racers, we naturally want to finish as high as possible. And I suppose as high as possible is a championship one, isn't it? But uh, the reality is we know we're still we're still on a journey within the team at the moment. You know, we've got a lot of investment in infrastructure which is ongoing that hasn't uh, influenced any of our cars yet we also knew that um, we had a few compromises with, with the start of the 22 process uh, that was revolving around issues with brexit and covid etc which affected us slightly more differently because we, our wind tunnel is, is, is remote it's in europe uh, and that sort of thing so i think we we were realistic about where we could be it, it is an opportunity to get to the front but we've still got a few things 
that are below the standard you need to be at, I suppose, to really be guarantee you're going to be at the front. Equally, we we need to consolidate a top four stroke, top three kind of capability. And uh, clearly new regulations put some massive perturbation in that process because if you've got stability, you can build and build new regs. You kind of start again. But, um, I, you know, we've got a team certainly capable of doing that. And I think if we could um, achieve that this year, then it's kind of like, well, yes, we've got back to where we were. Now let's build on this new car and these new regulations and begin to use that new infrastructure to take the next steps. You say your wind tunnels in Cologne. How much does that cost you in terms of efficiency, just day to day? I, I think that's one of the biggest things. I mean, we've had some brilliant support from Total Wind Tunnel for a long time now, and it's served us incredibly well. But you can't just rush into the tunnel and have a look at something, you know, an aero or a, even a model designer or so on and think actually we're going to change that for tomorrow because we can make this next step or the reaction time to turn something around where you've got that agility we really don't have that you know we've got to pre-plan an awful lot freight stuff out every day you know have a have a defined plan work through that plan and then react a little bit afterwards but i think i think from an efficiency point of view that's definitely detrimental because the i think the agility of, of aero development particularly in the environment of new regs is incredibly important when you haven't quite got the ability just to walk next door, which is how it's going to be, hopefully later this year, early next year, um, it means that you've got to uh, be a little bit more structured and, and planned in your approach. And what about the Mercedes power unit? Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you're the only senior engineer in Formula One who's worked with every power unit manufacturer. Are you with the right one now? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, Mercedes have had a brilliant history with their power unit since since 2014. Um, you know, they led the way with some of the innovations we saw with their architecture of the engine. Uh, they were, I mean, to be honest, when they were launched, I remember distinctly um, Nico Rosberg doing a race distance on day two of in Jerez in 2014. And everyone was like, wow, you know, we were all struggling to get to run our cars at that point. So they've always been ahead. I think it's leveled up a lot more since then. You know, there were, was a long period when there was a huge disparity in power unit performance and capability and how you use it, you know. And Mercedes led the charge and set the standard. Um, and I think, I think they continue to be, to be in, in very good shape. And I think, uh, although it's a lot closer now, you know, there's a lot of very clever, incredibly competitive people at Bricksworth who are keen to, to make sure they're uh, on top of their game. And, um, you know, we enjoy working with them. How much do the, the power units vary in terms of architecture? A lot. I mean, yeah, I am. I, I have worked with all the, <laughs> all the different <laughs> manufacturers. You're the man who knows. So I've been there, yeah. Um, I mean, look, I mean, I, they've probably changed a bit since I last worked with some of them. But, um, I mean, there's two schools, you know, there's the, there's the compressor at the front um, and then, then there's a compressor and a turbo together at the back. And then the various knock-on effects that come from that, you know, the volume you've got left in your gearbox, how the volume you have to use in the front of the chassis, all of that sort of thing. So architecturally, uh, those two directions make quite a significant difference. You've got various ways of cooling as well, which is definitely different between all the power units to work with. Some are, you know, lots of bits and pieces around that you need to package and place, but give you a bit of flexibility. Others are very compact and contained, but with less flexibility to distribute various components. So they're all they're all very different. I have to say the Mercedes engine is is very compact and a uh, and a pleasure to work with actually on chassis design because it kind of slots in perfectly. Very compact, but were even you surprised to see Mercedes do their size zero side pods this year? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, knowing yeah. what you're working with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, you know, hats off to them for for coming up with that interpretation and having, uh, you know, the courage to go with it. I think it's great to see such diversity. One of the biggest concerns of before 22 was, oh, every car is going to look the same. You know, we heard that comment an awful lot. As it turns out, the side pods were the biggest difference, I think, between cars. And Mercedes really went to an extreme. So, yes, I, was, I, I, I think we were all surprised, but it's great to see a team having the courage to... And, you know, and, and the, the, the innovation that's gone into that, uh, to have something that's so different. Here's an exciting update for all you fans looking to add a little F1 edge to your summer wardrobe or to level up your outfit for when you next attend a Grand Prix. Exclusive global licensee F1 Eyewear have created three collections of eyewear with their red, gold and trackside collections. Expect elite designs, cool looks and the chance to be a part of the exhilarating world of Formula One. Designed for fans, built to be on track and engineered to push boundaries. 
Discover the Red Collection, which emits everything Formula One with its precision in details and innovation, leading to the highest performance of eyewear. Striking the perfect balance between streetwear and on track, there is a style for everyone. The Gold Collection offers a luxuriously vintage range with racy modern styling, using the very finest materials to give you the very best in eyewear design, fit and technology. While their newest trackside collection is sold at the Paddock Club and Fan Zone points at all races, so look out for them and their offering of a range of collector's item frames. All this is available to you on their website at f1eyewear.com. That's f1eyewear.com. James, let's talk about your two lads, the drivers. First of all, Lando Norris, the real deal. Yeah, Land- Lando's been fantastic. You know, he's grown every year. I think he's been with us. You know, he's a, he's a driver who now recognises, even though he's still really quite early in his career in many respects, but he recognises exactly what he needs from the car, and his feedback is incredibly precise. So, I- I've always felt that you know a, a driver has matured to a level where, in terms of feedback, they're really useful to the team when they can project forward and think well. This is a night race, so we're in hot conditions now, but qualifying is going to be cold, so let's not change that setup. Even though it feels a bit oversteery now, it's going to be good for later. When they've got that ability to really think at that level rather than the here and now, um, you know you, you know that they're, they're on, a, on a certain level, which uh, is very, you know, very high, I think, and, and, and Lando's reached that. And his performances this year, and Imola is a great example, has been... Uh, have been absolutely fantastic. But James, he's one of these guys who doesn't make mistakes. I know, his consistency is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing, is when you get to a point where you're not even worrying about a spin or something like that. I know it could happen to anyone at any time because they all push really hard, but but he's incredibly consistent. It's, it's, it's great to see. What about Daniel? Do you think he's more comfortable in this year's car compared to last year's? Uh, I d- definitely do, yeah. I think... Um, um, it was a real shame in, in Miami that he couldn't get his quali lap in because I think he would have been close to Lando. He was in in Imola. In fact, he didn't get his final quali lap there either because of the uh, the conditions and the red flags. So I think he's much happier. I think the car suits his what he's looking for, suits his driving style and his requirements from a car much more than last year. Last year's car was um, had extremes of strengths and weaknesses, and we kind of saw that in the Netherlands where we, we really struggled and then in Monza where we where we flew and, and we won you know so that was a great example of how our car last year had its strengths and weaknesses and we knew what they were and we know that some of those strengths and weaknesses were the weaknesses in particular were working against what Daniel was trying to do we we, we took a lot of notice with the, with the the benefit of new regs for the 22 car of the characteristics which caused those issues and tried to um, iron them out as best we could. There's always a compromise in doing that, but we didn't really want to face the same situation again where we had a, pe- a bit of a peaky car. And that seems to have worked. So whilst we've definitely got more work to do on the current car, we're not you know, we're not um, quite where we want to be. It's definitely easier to drive. It's definitely more consistent through corner bounces and different corner speeds. And I think that's um, definitely allowed Daniel to exploit more of his talent in the, in the current car. And of course, this is the second time you've worked with Daniel. Yes. Um, I'm thinking, what, 2013 was the last time back at Toro Rosso. Well, How has he evolved as a driver since then? I mean, since then, he's got race wins and, and, and so on. So, he, you know, he's evolved a huge amount in that respect. I think that was probably a, a great relief for him because uh, certainly back then he was, a, he was immensely pumped up and um, ambitious to, to, drink, to have the opportunity to go and prove himself with a car that was capable of winning. And he, and he did that really well when he... Uh, went to Red Bull, we want, well, he's done that here as well, I suppose, but we need to give him still a better car at this stage. So he's matured a great deal. You know, I think the the confidence and, and the being much more comfortable in the environment is there before he was, he wanted to really prove himself. He's done that now, you know, and he, he just wants to enjoy his racing and uh, continue to um, to succeed. So, uh, Is yeah. he more relaxed now? He's, he's, more, he's more relaxed, just as, just as ambitious and pumped as ever. But just, I think, more comfortable. You know, he's, he's, he's shown what he can do, so he doesn't have to prove that anymore. But um, he does want to continue. He do, he, I think there's definitely life there still to go and, and do more. 
and and as always, just like back then, he's a lot of fun to work with and a, and a, and a great guy to know as well as um, a good driver. I'm guessing the post-Monza party was pretty good with him last year, right? Yes, well, I was at home, to be honest with you, so I, I was... Oh, uh, no, you weren't there. I was celebrating through a congratulatory I mean, email. Because, James, people listening may <laughs> not be aware, that was your first win in Formula One as well. I mean... For one of my... Yeah, for a card yeah. under my direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how sweet was that? Oh, it was great. You know, I mean, I, I I wrote to the team straight afterwards. You know, we've now we've we've designed a race winning car, guys. You know, which is a great feeling, and and the, the fact that it was largely on merit. I know our two closest competitors went out of the race, but we were ahead of them at that point anyway. And you know, we we, we felt we could have had the same result. I think, regardless of what happened in the race. So. It, it was it was extremely satisfying, and I think it kind of like I say that the circuit, the car and low down force, it all played to its strengths, and basically it showed us well that's what it takes to win a race. You just got to do that everywhere, and so it was great to see what it takes and be there. Now tell us a little bit more about the job, technical director. What does that term mean in 2022? Yeah, it's changed a lot over the years, I think, the role of a, of a TD. When I started in F1, it was it was just at the point of where the TD wasn't necessarily just designing the whole thing and had a, a staff just to do what he needed them to do. It was beginning to expand to a, to a big enough environment where you had specialists who would you know, actually contribute quite significantly to the way the car looks. So I caught it in that almost transition. I think 10 years before then, it was really down to the chief designer or the technical director to lay the whole thing out which is really what I wanted to do when I was when I was young I suppose managing the process and, and, and laying out the, the wider the wider objectives and then I think it was once described as conducting an orchestra being in there which is exactly what it is you're spinning lots of plates and you're trying to keep the whole thing on track from a technical perspective setting priorities making the big decisions being clear on, on the nature of the performance you think you need to generate because there's different types of performance actually in an F1 car and you can put your emphasis um, on various areas depending on what uh, what you're trying to achieve. Um, in 22, it's um, I've got a staff of 250 people and it's, it's very much a managerial task as well as a technical one. I mean, how much designing are you doing nowadays? Much less than I'd like to be doing, to be honest <laughs> with you. I'd much prefer to be sat at a CAD station or deep in a data system or doing a simulation because... Um, that's where we've all come from, you know, but uh, I think it's much more about saying what we need to do. You know, it's, it's really, it's, 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 it's so complicated now. You don't, you very rarely have one person who can do this. You know, there's a few around who have, have been able to do it throughout their careers. Nowadays, you've got sections of, of technical departments full of incredibly talented, really uh, ambitious experts on aerodynamics, on control systems, on uh, you know, design materials analysis all this sort of thing it's it encompasses so much and it's really a case of trying to direct that to i suppose you've got a blueprint in your head and you're directing that whole resource that enormous amount of um, energy and talent and budget even in a cost cap towards the right goals uh, and coordinated in a way which produces the best result but you're also looking at how you interact you know that the culture of the team needs to be right you've got to, it's almost like a football manager he's not playing football but he's kind of conducting exactly what happens and how it works. And you're trying to make sure the culture is correct. So everyone is working at their best. You're empowering people, you know, or you're reining them in because you've got to try and get your priorities straight. So it's, it's a lot of managerial stuff, but uh, which is great because it, it's definitely a, an important part of it. But I most enjoy the technical discussions and, and jumping in front of a CAD screen with someone. You talk about the culture. So sorry to take you back to that dark moment after Bahrain, but... When, the, when, when you've had a weekend like that, what was your game plan when you got back to the factory? You said that already on Saturday you were planning meetings, but there's not a, I'm guessing there isn't a blame culture here. It's the opposite. It's, it has to be the opposite because it, it, it's, it doesn't work, you know, and um, it's not how we operate anyway. But rather than asking who did what, what you've got to ask is why have we got these problems and how can we solve them? And I have to I have to say the reaction of the team was absolutely fantastic. You know, there was no fear, there was no uh, uh, frustration. You know, none of that stuff. We we all sat down, had a really mature discussion on well, we've got a problem. Let's think through how we can fix it. We looked at all sorts of different ideas. We set out a we set out a plan very rapidly. We recognised 
we'd need to bide our time. If you start throwing stuff at the car in a panic, then you're going to be in trouble, particularly in a cost cap. You're going to be in trouble pretty quickly, I think. So it was a case of stepping back, having a really mature approach. Uh, the team were massively energized by it. You know, they had a challenge and they had some deadlines and they were desperate to, to, to succeed with the time they had. And um, we just got on with it. And it was it was um, it, it was actually a pleasure to even though we had a, a, a problem to solve. It was a pleasure to work with everyone on it. Now, you first became a technical director back in 2005. For people who don't know, having started in Formula One with Jordan back in 98. So it was only your seventh year in Formula One. You were just 33 years old. Were you ready? How well cooked were you in terms of technical director? Um, Knowing what you know now. No, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I I was ready for some of it, definitely, because I I knew technically what I wanted to do. You know, again, we were small enough in that team at the time to be more technical than managerial, I suppose. What I wasn't ready for is how much effort goes into actually running an operation, you know, with, with people in it. And, and with budgets and with all these other things which suddenly land on your desk. And uh, all, all the, I mean, at the time, you know, we, we had just gone through a, a buyout with uh, Midland. So they were new to Formula One. So that, that needed to be managed and discussed. And to be fair, you know, they were, they were very open to, to, to good discussion too, but perhaps weren't also quite prepared to, 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 to really know what it took. So, so there were that sort of thing. So high level meetings of that nature. And, you know, we had big staff turnover. We, we had a very small budget. We were trying to achieve more than we could really afford. We had a cranky old wind tunnel by that point as well. So we were quite behind there. But we were desperately ambitious to get back to where Jordan had been just a few years before, which, you know, was, was winning races, actually, in, in some cases. So the core of the team were, were, were really robust. And I was really lucky to have that. Great communication, r- really ambitious bunch very talented bunch as well which you know which was really important so technically i think we felt we need we knew what we needed to do i I came into it when the car was underperforming had several issues and they were just just by directing an approach it was quite easy to solve but the the other half of it and and also the weight on your shoulders was was something i had to get used to and i kind of likened it to trying to solve a technical problem while there was someone standing in the corner throwing breeze blocks at me and i was dodging all these problems whilst trying to actually concentrate on the technical issues that we had uh, to try and make a car go quicker. So I wasn't quite ready for that, but um, uh, I didn't want to fail at it either. You know, I relished the challenge of trying to trying to do it. How much designing were you actually doing back in 2.5? I think it was more... So, so my, although I've, I've done a bit of design in the past, my background is really vehicle dynamics, simulations and trackside engineering. I suppose performance engineering, you could call it. I've done some aerodynamics as well. So I had this mix of performance topics and uh less less specific designs so there's detailed design there's like the architecture of the car so two different different parts of that so for me it was it was at the time specifying what we needed to do with the car from a design perspective but not the actual design work itself so we ended up with a, a keel mounted front suspension which was a trend that we i thought we should look at so we looked at that we specified how the cooling layout looked for example uh, this sort of thing. So that that, that came from me. Uh, the details of impact tests and the chassis design, it was definitely best left for the experts. But then it was a case of, of looking at where we needed to improve. Um, we also had to integrate a new engine at the time as well. So th- there were there were sort of aspects of that where it was like, well, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to do this? And and how are we going to schedule our updates? And what should those updates be, et cetera? So it, it was it was that, that sort of approach where you're specifying what we needed to do rather than details. But Certainly, you know, you look at that car now, which, although it didn't really do much, will always be my favourite car because, I, you know, that Midland uh, MF1, it was called, I think. Because I was going to say, which has been your favourite car, but it, it is, is the first one. It is, because I, I know how hard we had to work. You know, we're in this uncertain period of transitioning ownership. We didn't really have a budget. We were losing a lot of people. And we worked so hard to not only just make it to the track, but to try and improve, you know, because we were miles off by that point. And it was an incredibly satisfying experience. I remember launching it and the, the drivers going on the track and I sort of led the, led the track operation at that point as well. And it was it was just a really satisfying thing to, uh, Didn't to see. Didn't you launch it in Red Square in Moscow? There was, no, that, that was the launch of the, of the team. Oh, okay. 
Uh, I just remember photographs of a sort of snowy. Yeah, there scrape. was. Yeah, yeah, there was. I think it was with a Jordan with Alex car Schneider at the time and, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and Colin Collis. Yeah. Now we we launched at Silverstone, so it's really simple. We just did a few stand ups uh, to 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 the journalists and someone who were who were present, and then we ran the car there and then. But we allowed everyone to stay so they could see it running for the first time. James, how stressful is your job? You talk about trying to get on with the job with people throwing breeze blocks at you. I mean. <laughs> I guess dealing with the stress is something that comes with age and experience as well. I, I, th- I think it does because I think you begin you begin to just you know you get used to it and it, you recognise it as part of the job. You know it is very much part of part of the job. If you were s- sitting there and it was easy and either you're not pushing hard enough or you're lucky enough to have an incredibly quick car, what counteracts that massively is the fact that it's such a fascinating subject to work in. You meet some wonderful people along the way as well, which I've been incredibly lucky to to do and um, we're all very competitive and every couple of weeks we get an opportunity to see how well we're doing so yes of course it's stressful it's it's a really it's a really difficult sport and, and one which is incredibly competitive but with with the right racing mindset that's not an issue you know actually what you want to see is your car going as quick as possible has your hobby unexpectedly become a lucrative side hustle and you're looking to sell goods online or Do you already have a business and want to reach more customers but don't know where to turn? Shopify is the all-in-one commerce platform that can help you start, run and grow your business no matter where you are on your journey. Shopify allows you to set up an online store, connect with your customers, drive sales, accept all major payment methods and manage your day-to-day in a hassle-free way. Their tools and resources can help you supercharge your knowledge, your sales and your success. That's because Shopify has thousands of integrations and third-party apps, from on-demand printing to accounting to advanced chatbots and beyond, all designed to help you level up in the world of business. I love how they are breaking down barriers and making it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. It's no wonder that every 28 seconds, an entrepreneur like you makes their first sale on Shopify. Who knows where it could take you next? Go to shopify.com slash beyond the grid, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash beyond the grid right now. Shopify.com slash beyond the grid. Let's wind the clock back now. Where it all began, uh, we've touched on Midland, but you joined Jordan Grand Prix back in 1998 how did that opportunity arise? Oh, it was a really long road, actually. But I, I knew I knew it when I was about 14 that I wanted to be in, in Formula One. That was, I was very lucky to have a clear plan at such a young age. But as a what? As a driver? As a, an engineer? Um, as a... I, think, I think at that age you always want to be a driver, but I, I kind of never had the opportunities and I'd probably been rubbish anyway. So, uh, no, it was um, actually engineering, really, because, you know, I was lucky enough. I mean, I was asking questions of my dad who was an engineer when I was very young about how things work so and he's a car enthusiast too so it was inbuilt right from an extremely young age that that's what I was most interested in but I think um yeah I I I kind of got my degree into a a situation where I could ensure that I looked at subjects which were most relevant to motor racing not just for my CV but just to learn you know I needed to learn certain science and engineering topics to, to, to be qualified effectively to go and do the job. But also my third year project, which was a data acquisition for a competition car that not only did I have to design but make and test, through which I learned vehicle dynamics. You know, I, I learned that at university. So I kind of tuned things which, were, which made me not just on a CV relevant, but also gave me the experience I really needed to go and do it. Then I was working for a car consultancy company with the plan definitely to get into motor racing somehow. I actually did some design work for Le Mans projects and stuff in that company too. So I got my foot in the door to a certain extent. And then there was this this job ad cropped up as a for a data engineer, which is nowadays called a performance engineer, um, which was data analysis and all the other things I'd done at uni and and simulation, which I'd be doing at my, at the, at my work at the time. And I decided that, um, yeah, that almost sounded perfect. So I'll, I'll go for it. And I got it. So the pathway for an engineer, you, you went straight into Formula One. You don't have to go through F3, F2. No, I went for- straight into F1. I, I was lucky enough to find a role which really matched well with the experiences I'd had. Looking at CVs nowadays, you know, there's some 
enormously talented young engineers out there and and you, you kind of want to pick every one of them when you read some of the cvs you see now but those little bits of experience that you can get over weekends or you know in life formally definitely count count well now i think then it was probably um probably more about expertise because i think formula one was growing at that point into the the shape that we see now with 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 new technologies and simulations and the way we do things so jordan you start out as this performance engineer you then become a race engineer i think with takuma sato first yes. of all how do you reflect on your 12 years with the team um i i <laughs> how mad was it <laughs> <laughs> it was um oh, i i loved it actually i mean it was a, a team that when i joined it was massively punching above its weight in many respects but the weight came in the in the nature of the people there and the way they worked you know gary anderson was td who worked night and day you know and lived and breathed every second of it i learned a huge amount from gary but also the people i was working with directly we had a race engine department which was also sort of vehicle dynamics and everything else of about five people i think and so you know just for perspective how many would be in that department now crikey if you if you added there'd be about 40 plus people now to do the same job um and they're separate departments nowadays as well so uh we we really did do everything but that's how you learn you know you you kind of in those days you can get a very broad scope within a team and and i really enjoyed it i mean going to um I, I, I think I, I joined the, the next day I was up at five to go to Barcelona testing, which I hadn't realized would be the case. So um, I think Gary just dropped in and said, welcome, you, you know, is your kit, you're going to be able to play tomorrow morning. And away we went. And, I, and uh, a few weeks later, I was in Australia. So it was like, wow, you know, I'm actually, actually here. Actually living the dream. Extraordinary. Yeah, it was really amazing. Um, and, and I think what I wasn't prepared for there is just how high the standards were and how quickly everything happened. That was the biggest surprise, I think. You know, you were turning things around so quickly, there was never time to step back and think about what you were trying to do. You had to have the capacity to do that on the go, you know. But no, I absolutely loved it. Work, worked with some brilliant people. You know, the team changed quite a lot over the years towards when I, I ended up leaving. But um, I reflect on it with a huge number of fond memories. And like every place I've worked at, it's the people that make the difference. And I work with some brilliant people. Huh? So you were there for Spa 98? I was the there at Spa. At yeah. Spa with Damon, yes, winning indeed. the race. Yeah, I remember it well. I remember Eddie doing his jig along the, <laughs> along the pit lane. <laughs> It was great to see that because it was it was kind of everyone felt we, sh we really should get a race win now because things were going pretty well. I think the car started the season a little bit uh, on the back foot, but rapidly developed, and uh, yeah, that was a, that was a great high to see. Yeah, and that was the precursor to, to the team's best season. Yes, which was of course ninety nine, two wins, uh, Frentzen finishing third, the team finishing third in the constructors' championship as well. EJ has tried to convince me over the years that if the cards had fallen a little bit differently that year, you could have won the world championship. Do you agree with that? I, I, to be honest, I do, actually, because, you know, we had a, we had a great car. We, I remember we had Heinz's lucky setup, which seemed to work everywhere. What do you mean? Uh, the car setup, so the setup of the car. We just used the same one every... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we might diversify a little bit for Monaco, you know, with a, a slightly softer rear spring. But it basically worked, the car worked really well. And we had, you know, Heinz Howard was absolutely on fire that year. He was, it, everything just clicked with him. And I think, I think Eddie's right, because I think we missed a podium in Canada with a brake disc failure. We underperformed in Malaysia, the first year of the Malaysian Grand Prix. We, we had an issue there. We should and could have won that Nürburgring was it Nürburgring yeah Nürburgring yeah well I think, I think Johnny Herbert won in the end but we had um we had well, he, he, did Heinz press something on he, the steering he wheel pressed or? the wrong button on the way out the pit lane the car right. stalled 
Um, yeah. but we were we and were it, ahead. Yeah, the win was on, wasn't so it? The win was definitely on. You know, and he I think he qualified in the front row as well. So. Um, all of the, I mean, I know you can probably do do the same analysis for whoever won the championship, but uh, I think actually just just a few, a few um, changes to the, the 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 results of those races could really have put us in contention. Now, how good was Frentzen? Because we've all read the stories of when he was Schumacher's teammate in the Mercedes Junior team. That some people say, you know, he was quicker than Michael over one lap. Of all the drivers you've worked with, and I've got a massively long list in front of me here. Heinz on his day, how good? Uh, uh, absolutely amazing. He, I mean, right up as good as anyone you've worked abso- with, and I'm including absolutely. Max Verstappen yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah. He was when he was in, in in the right place, and he was calm and confident, and uh, and so on. He had this magic that he could turn on, and we saw that throughout '99. Actually, so he was an outstandingly talented driver and a lovely chap to work with as well. Another driver I wanted to ask you about from that period is Giancarlo Fisichella. He worked with him on various different occasions. I'm thinking when he lined up on the, the front row at Spa, 09. Yes. I mean, Fizzy on his day was right on it. Yes. Would you employ Fizzy today at McLaren? The Fizzy of, you know, whenever his best year yes. was. Yeah, I I think so. I mean, again, he was he was good to work with. A bit like Heinz in a way. He sort of fluctuated a little bit. You had to keep him focused, you know. And when he was, again, he was, he was absolutely outstanding. So... I think so. Yeah, if the right fizzy turned up every morning, I definitely think we'd be on to a winner there. Yeah. Now, we've touched on the change of ownership in 2005, but one thing I did want to ask you was that was an era when money was short and you had to be thrifty. And is that experience helping you today with the cost cap? It does. I mean, it's a very different environment now. And McLaren, you know, is obviously a much... Well, in fact, every team is much bigger than it was then. But... Um, uh, it does because you recognise just how much you can do on a on a low budget. I mean, you know, we we lasted. I think the beginning of two thousand six, we lasted on about five sets of drive shafts for ages, and we knew each of them intimately, their history and when to put them on the car and so on. But we made them last, and uh, you know, we we had a we had a big board up where, where we had the, the, the supplier priorities to make sure that we, you know, in terms of a payment schedule, we were on on target to make sure we had everything we needed. So it, it was almost micromanaging the whole process all the way through to make sure we could race within such an incredibly tight budget. But it does show you what you can do, and it, do, it does help w- within the cost cap. And in terms of choosing a development path as well, you couldn't throw... I mean, the big teams back then were bringing new bits almost every Absolutely, weekend, weren't they? Yeah. Whereas you had to be a bit more selective like you do now. Like, just like we do now, yeah. And so I, I think what, what, it, what it taught me, and I think everyone who was involved in that very tight budget period is that yeah you have to set your priorities and you've got to recognize what really matters that's probably the biggest thing it taught me actually what actually matters you know do you want to go for that crazy f duct idea or whatever you know other things were floating around back then or do you actually just want to get the base car to be quicker because all of that can be used for next year to make another step and we, like i say whatever team you're in you want to win even though you're, you're right you know right at the back so we had this big ambition of trying to get ourselves back on track. We just needed a bit of stability and a bit of time. Um, and so you made logical decisions based on the amount of money you had and what actually mattered to you most. And a great example of this, so I, I won't bore you with it too long, but you know, we, we'd done, we'd done, we thought we'd, we had a new front wing, which would, would, would be better, but we did a bit of CFD work. Uh, we felt we had a direction. We'd seen what some of the competitors had done. We knew that it was an area of the car which hadn't budged for a while. We wanted to wanted to do the wind tunnel test it, and we didn't. Have, we couldn't afford enough aluminium to make to to make the front wing, you know. So, uh, we had a fantastic machinist in our in our aero group, and he worked over twenty four hours to gather as many bits of alley together as he could, make a modular front wing out of all the bits, stuck it together. We tested it. It did give us the eleven points or something. It's quite big that we thought it should, and we got it on the car and and. What a great story. That's the spirit of a small team where everyone just does whatever they can to make it work. And does that spirit prevail here at McLaren? It it does to a certain extent. It certainly did after Bahrain, you know, where we just all sat down, got together. How can we support each other? Let's let's make this work. But I think the efficiencies that you have in in such a a small, tight operation that we had back then in 2006 is difficult to replicate unless you're actually in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of desperation mode almost, isn't it? Well, it is, but a, but a desperation to succeed in the circumstances as well yeah. as a desperation to try and pay for something. Now, you've worked for four teams in Formula One. Jordan 
and Spiker, we'll call one. You then went to Sauber for 2010, just after BMW had pulled out from the team. What did you find when you arrived at Henville? Yes, it was uh, a bit of a shock when, because I'd already started talking to, they'd approached me actually, and uh, it turns out had BMW stayed on, they were going to ask me to join them anyway. So I was a bit, little bit gutted that I missed the sort of big team environment. But um, what I found at Sabah is a very diff- you know, a different culture, a different language, of course, which I couldn't speak. Um, but a, a very similar environment to the one I was used to, a small bunch who'd been doing it for years, a lot of parallels in a way to, I suppose, the old Jordan. Uh, situation and uh, some great facilities as well uh, you know Peter Sabber invested very wisely as he'd grown his Formula One team and uh, a bunch of people who were super easy and, and really good to work with so as an environment is recognizable there was lots of things which were unrecognizable and I had to sort of learn and get used to uh, there was a lot to do though you know the car when, when I arrived the car was, was quite draggy it would obviously been done over a period of great uncertainty with BMW pulling out. So everyone had been through an incredibly tough time with that. It lost a lot of people, of course, as well. So it was very much in a recovery mode. I recognise that one of the best things we could do is just settle everyone down and just give ourselves a bit of a long-term plan and start thinking forwards. And we had some issues. You know, we had chronic low-speed understeer. We had too much drag. We had all sorts of other things. So we set ourselves our priorities and we began to work through through them and gave ourselves a plan. And... Uh, and it, and, it, and it worked. And, uh, you know, my, my family joined me in, in Switzerland. We absolutely loved our time in the country as well as at the company. And boy, did you deliver because the 2012 car, the C31, four podiums. Mm. I think a lot of people thought Perez could have won that year's Malaysian Grand Prix yes, as well. Yes. <laughs> you probably definitely won them. How good was that car? And, and just talk, talk us through riding that wave of 2012. Uh, OK, well, it's, it's really interesting. You know, for various reasons, we it's all about exhaust blown diffusers. So... I think the first car I did was the C30, which was the 2011 car. And that was already a, a step, you know, and, and we had a really prolific time in the wind tunnel. Again, we set ourselves out a plan. We, we by then ditched the drag that we had on the previous car. Uh, we looked at some of our, we looked at different ways of looking at our sensitivities on the aero side. So we got ourselves, let, let's say, in the groove and the team were sort of, BMW was becoming a, a, a you know a history, but we did do an exhaust bl- blown diffuser, which were very very powerful in those days, but we couldn't really get the track to correlate for some reason, and because we were limited on budget, in the end we didn't do it, and then it got banned, and um, I approached Charlie Whiting at the time. I said, "Well, look, I know you've banned this, but if you did X, do you think that's okay?" He said, "No, I think that's all right," and it was basically using the coanda, coanda effect on a ramped bodywork shape which gave you some of the benefits of a exhaust blown diffuser. So we developed in an environment without that, but we're still reasonably competitive in scoring points. And we didn't have anything to lose from one year to the next in 2012. We had everything to gain by having effectively an exhaust blown diffuser. So when we hit the track, I'd actually left by the time it hit the track, unfortunately. But when we hit the track, whilst most people had taken a step back, we'd just taken a step forward. And... Uh, and the car was just really, really quick. It's, it's interesting that you say you could just ring up Charlie Whiting and put an idea to him. Is that what happened back then the whole time? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean, Charlie was, was brilliant to work with and he, he had a very pragmatic head. And he very incredibly experienced, very wise, very knowledgeable. And he'd kind of recognise an idea as being one that kind of you can get away with, I suppose. And he'd hint at, hint at you could get away with it. He didn't he didn't try and curtail innovation or anything. He He was always incredibly supportive. If... If, if you approached him in the right way about things, you know. And, uh, yeah, I just I just gave him a ring. I explained to him. I said, look, we, we think this is legal. What, what do you think? Because in a way, you could you could say it's illegal as well. And he said, no, I think you're all right with that. And we, and we got on with it. If you're looking for a way to save money and feel like you're eating restaurant-quality meals from the comfort of your own home, HelloFresh offers convenient, contact-free home delivery of delicious, easy-to-use meal kits designed to take the stress out of home cooking, and it's 30% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store. There are 50 weekly meal options to choose from, so variety is not an issue. You're sure to find something for everyone for every day of the week. 
I recently cooked up one of their sesame soy beef bowls with shredded carrots, buttery rice and sriracha mayo for the family. All the ingredients were provided for me and the easy step-by-step -step guide made it so simple that I had the meal on the table in under 30 minutes. I felt like a pro chef and I love the fact we were able to spend more time together as a family around the dinner table with no last minute shopping trips or having to worry about what we were going to eat. Tailor your HelloFresh order to meet your needs, change your delivery days, food preferences, and even skip a week if you want to. Go to HelloFresh.com slash grid16 and use the code grid16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash grid16 for up to 16 meals free and three free gifts. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Now, everything you've just described makes me think that you were set for a long period at Sauber. The family had come and joined you, enjoyed it. You'd made big inroads in terms of performance. Yeah, only two years there. Yeah, it was a shame because I, I, re I really loved the team. You know, it was a brilliant team to work with. Um, again, I, I had the pleasure of working with some fantastic people. The enthusiasm of all the guys there after getting over the BMW pull out was was really good and, and although lots of unfamiliar things a very familiar type of team for me so I'd love to have seen it through there were a couple of things I guess which led to me deciding to move on uh, which it wasn't the plan I wanted to stay the longer term one which I hadn't really thought through particularly well was that we had needed to make a decision about our kids education they were in a, a perfectly good system in, in Switzerland of course but we needed to either stick to that because it, was a, it began to diversify quite a lot to the UK system, or allow them to go back to the UK and, and continue with, with their education there. We reached a, a point where it was either going to be GCSEs or a you know, baccalaureate. So that was, that was actually one of the biggest decision points that we, we, uh, we found we needed to make, and we hadn't really thought through well enough beforehand, I think. And you didn't think of commuting if the children had gone back to the UK? You uh, wanted to stay together as a unit? We, we wanted to stay together because we... we we enjoyed it so much out there, you know. I mean, it, you go skiing every week. <laughs> <you know? laughs> they tell me. It's like half an hour from the factory. It's half an hour. Yeah. It's brilliant, yes. Yeah. So you're just like, why would we want to leave? The other thing, to be honest, though, is that I, I recognised the team was going to struggle with, with money. You know, it didn't really have the infrastructure to generate a lot of income. And um, I'd just been through that in my previous team. You know, well, I mean, Force India re recovered quite well, but I'd been through it already, and I thought, well, actually, am I just going to go through the same again? And I had there was interest, as it happens, from from McLaren at the time and a couple of other teams, and I thought maybe, given that we've got to decide on the kids, given that I'm I'm really not sure we're going to have the budget to take this any further. In fact, it's probably going to get more difficult now because we were more short of cash when I when I left than we were when we when I joined. That. Um, made a very difficult decision to move on but I was I was gutted because I loved working with the team and so Toro Rosso came next and could you do that largely from the UK um it was it was a mix actually so yes yeah, so I I luckily we had the whole area department was in the UK it was pretty small when I arrived in this tiny office but the, the wind tunnel was there it was working pretty well the obviously the base was in Italy it was actually in the old Minardi facilities at the time which was fascinating because I was always a Minardi fan when I was younger and I uh, you love the underdog. <laughs> well, no, no, exactly. I, I, I loved, I did, I did actually, because I had a, a thing about it at Minardi, and uh, it's lovely to see where it came from um, as a bit of anorak, you know. But um, yeah, Tour Rosso offered a, a fresh opportunity where actually it was it, it needed to grow, and um, even though it was effectively the B team of, of the owner of, of, of that team, you know, it had an enormously ambitious and enthusiastic uh, team principal in, in Franz Tost, you know, who, uh, he'd never meet a, ra a racer, more of a racer than Franz. Uh, and he wanted to see the team succeed and move forward. Um, we were starting from quite a compromised position. It wasn't performing well. And uh, that I, I sort of recognised having gone to Sauber, having done my stuff with Midland through to Force India and then at Toro Rosso, it's something that I thought, actually, I can do this. You know, I can take something which isn't performing and, and try and try and turn it around with all my colleagues around me and uh, it presented a similar challenge but in a more stable environment. The drivers are all terrified of Helmut Marco. what about the technical people within that system? Some are and some aren't I think. <laughs> How did you find Helmut to work with? Helmut was direct <laughs> but um, you know he I, I think to be honest with the challenges that he faced and with the standards that Red Bull was setting and expectations he he needed to be and um, you know, he, he, he only really intervened when, 
you know, we, there was something that wasn't quite right, you know, and it was sometimes driver related and sometimes team related. But most of the time we were pretty independent, to be honest. I was going to say you're pretty independent because I was yeah. going to ask how much were your hands tied in terms of what you could do technically? Not too much. Principally budget. I think um, in terms of how big we could really grow. I mean, I think if you're a company with two teams, you don't really want them competing with each other. And the, the purpose of Toro Rosso is to be secondary anyway in, the, in terms of feeding through the driver program and, and that sort of thing. So um, it had grown into a slight anomaly in that respect. You know, it was the only team that wasn't the priority of the owner because they already had their big priority with you know, Red Bull, which of course have been fantastically successful. So I, I think in that respect, we were... S- slightly tied but the freedoms we had and the brilliant support we got from you know Red, Mr. Mattachy used to come and visit you know, once a year and so on was um, was really strong so it was uh, it was good to be able to sort of play a role in turning it round with, with many others involved too and getting to a more competitive position but you knew that you weren't really set up to win so there's only so far you could take it and uh, but that was you know it, it was Again, it was a, it was a great place to work, and I think of all the, excluding where I'm working now because you, you can't really include where you're working now. But of all the, the teams I've worked with, I think that was the one I enjoyed most because the Italians are brilliant engineers and fantastic people to work with. And you've had great experience of different countries as well: the UK, Italy, Switzerland. Yeah, becoming the United Nations of Formula One. Well, well yes, I mean I've, I've worked with every country that's got a Formula One team. <laughs> yes. in it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting because we're all trying to achieve the same things. But where you've got these, certainly with Sauber and to a certain extent with Toro Rosso, you've got these isolated pockets trying to do the same thing rather than a Silicon Valley in the UK where people, you know, circulate and you you're broadly doing similar things. Seeing it done differently over there really taught me a, a lot. And Toro was, of course the junior team to Red Bull Racing but did you also feel over there that you were the junior team to Ferrari? No. You know it was it's funny I mean obviously Italy, Italy's an immensely passionate country and Formula One was only Ferrari for them and I had several quite stern discussions with uh, people outside of the team about there are two teams in Italy guys it's not just one but um, no 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 it was it was a team in its own right you know and and we wanted it to succeed and uh, you know we did we did have some we did have some good results as, as well whilst I was there. So, uh, uh, yeah, the spirit within the team was fantastic. And, um, uh, yeah, I just I just really enjoyed it. We were all sad, although my family didn't come with me. They did come over uh, over summer to the apartment I had there. And um, uh, we all thoroughly enjoyed our time there. Yeah, it's a very beautiful part of Italy, isn't it? Now, uh, just two of the drivers that you had through Toro Rosso, I'd love to talk to you about briefly. Carlos Sainz, Max Verstappen, 2015. Was Max ready to race? At just 17? I think he was, actually, yeah. I mean, he was Im- immensely talented. I remember when we tested him, I think it was Brazil the year before, and he got this huge oversteer on in turn one. And, we, you know, you see that happening with someone who's, who's 16 at the time, I think. And you think, OK, he's going to spin. And he just hung on, and then he went, like, wow, OK, that was pretty good. And then the lap time started coming in. So I think I think he was, yeah. Um, and, and similarly with Carlos, actually. They're both incredibly mature for their age. But... I think both felt a lot of pressure as well to succeed early. And that was probably the and thing. And beat the other one. And beat the other one. And the competition between them was, was huge. Yeah. And there really wasn't much between them, particularly in qualifying, if, if no. memory serves. No, no, no. I mean, I, mean I, think, I think Max normally had the edge in the race uh, at that stage. Uh, and that was a bit of a learning process, I think, for Carlos, which he, you know, he, he definitely got on top of. But um, no, in terms of just pure lap time, they were, they were both pretty close, yeah. So were you surprised that Red Bull Racing took Max ahead of Carlos at the Spanish Grand Prix in 2016? I don't think I really thought about it, actually. I mean, there was always a chance that one of them would be, would be uh, picked up because they were both performing well. So no, I, I wasn't really... I think what I was thinking at the time was who's going to replace Max and are they going to be quick enough, which uh, was probably the biggest thing in my, my mind at the time. It's just the here and now, isn't it? That's yeah, it what is. you're dealing <laughs> with, isn't it? Look, was there ever the opportunity for you to move up to Red Bull Racing, um, there was there were some hints, you know. I think there were a few a few possibilities, but to be honest, I was I was really happy at, at Toro Rosso, and I think I don't know. It's probably a personal thing, but I, on a personal level, I get a lot of satisfaction of taking something and trying to trying to take the next step with it. Not 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 from an ego point of view, but simply because you've got a very clear challenge, you got a target, you got a bunch of people who are desperate to get there too. And it's very satisfying when it when it works. You know, it's it doesn't always work, of course. You, you can't guarantee it, but that's what I think. 
I enjoy most, even that, even if that's up to the top, which is obviously where that's something I would like like to get to. Going into a team that's already incredibly successful, what do you do? You know, you just got to carry on the momentum. You know, if you take a step backwards, then is it something you did or was it destined to happen anyway? So I'm not sure how how attractive that really was for me. I, I much prefer getting into somewhere and thinking, right, let's let's pull together and make that next step. The sense of satisfaction and the sense of uh, achievement for everyone, not just for, not just for me. Well, if you can do that, is is uh, something I really enjoy. Well, the process is underway here at McLaren. Why did you choose? McLaren and to leave Toroso and come here so I think I was driving from the first meeting with Honda when Zach called me <laughs> so <laughs> we just inherited Honda at Toroso and Zach called me out of the blue which I wasn't expecting and um said to you, can we talk to you so that, that, that's sort of how it how it got initiated they knew I had a contract and that was you know that needed to be respected and so on but there was interest there but to be brutally honest when I was a youngster watching Formula One and I got into it just just as the Senna Prost days began to emerge and those you know that that time I always wanted to work for McLaren right from very young and um, that opportunity came along but it was also what I really liked from the discussions I'd had with with Zach and others uh, early on was that they had an ambition to turn it around which kind of seats what I enjoy but also they had a lot of backing and the budget and by and large the infrastructure we're investing in the bits that we're missing now to go and do that. And I thought, great, finally there's a team here which actually have what it takes to to take that next step. And I, I always wanted that in those previous teams, but that wasn't it wasn't quite there at the time. Was there one thing that convinced you to sign on the dotted line? I, I, th- I think it was it was the in- the early interactions being so clear and how how what, a, a very clear plan had been set out of what wants to achieve, and the fact that there was a realism about you can't just flick a switch and make a car go a second quicker or whatever the lap time deficit is. That's what I needed to hear because when some of the best team principals I've worked for aren't guys who come and say why isn't our car quick enough? They come and say how can I help you make our car go quicker? And that's exactly the approach that I, I found with McLaren. It's like we've got to pull together, and let's see let's see how far we can take this. And and that for me was was a fantastic thing to hear because everyone just had the, wanted the same thing, um, and it convinced me, particularly you know with the history of this wonderful team as well, that uh, you know and undoubtedly the excellent people who I've since met and worked with, and they are brilliant people, that we had we had what it what it takes. We have just got to go and face the challenge, and I, I like a challenge. You had quite a prolonged period of gardening leave. And at one point, I believe Helmut Marko wanted Lando Norris. He said, if you give me Lando Norris, you can have James now. Is that, is that true? Uh, I, I think, I, to be honest, I stayed, I stayed out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I, I let them negotiate. I, I, uh, it, was the first, it was the only time I've ever had gardening leave, and it was probably the most stressful six months I've ever had. <laughs> I was going to say, what did you get up to? Did you learn <laughs> any new skills? No, I just or? did all the domestic chores I hadn't done for the past 20-odd years. But I, I think... Um, no, because you're anticipating. You know, you're you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm I'm missing stuff now because I'm not involved in, in the sport. You know, what's happening? What's well, happening a serious case of FOMO. Yeah, so you're like, <laughs> I, need, I need to get back. You know, it's I need true. to get it's on with this. Yeah. And, so the um, mind doesn't stop. No, not at all. It actually just yeah. anticipates, and it's quite frustrating. And you're kind of waiting to to get on with it, and uh, you know, get on with that challenge that you've got. So it actually, it wasn't a relaxing period at all. But, but yes, it, it all kind of worked out in the end and I, I arrived. Well, James, everyone listening to this wishes you the best of luck. Hoping to get another win this year. Everything's crossed, I'm sure, all the McLaren fans out there. Best of luck with it and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. I could have talked to James all day. His knowledge of and his passion for the sport is so infectious and he seems to be the perfect fit for McLaren, a brilliant mind and a great organiser. I love the fact he was already planning the meetings for Monday morning while sat on the pit wall during that difficult weekend in Bahrain. James, many thanks for your time. It was great to chat and best of luck for the remainder of the season. If you're hungry for more on McLaren's history, then please take a look at the Beyond the Grid archive. We've got incredible interviews with both Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo, team principal Andreas Seidel, CEO Zach Brown, and the legendary engineer Steve Nichols for you to enjoy. And of course, some of their great drivers in history like Alain Prost and Mika Hakkinen. 
Please remember to send in your thoughts and stories about James Key as well. I love reading them and I'll give a shout out to some of them next week. And that, of course, brings me on to what you sent in about Esteban Ocon after last week's show. Let's start with this from Joshua Barrera. Esteban's win in Hungary last year was the first race I watched live on television, says Joshua. It was like a movie designed to remind fans what Formula One is all about and the stories it can provide. Well, what a race to start with, Joshua. It was a tremendous one and some of the team radio we played on last week's show really gave me goosebumps all over again. And let's hear next from Dan, who says, Gotta put this on here. I have a new perspective on Esteban after listening to his second round on Beyond the Grid. He seems a lot more mature, and I loved hearing about the struggle of that year out of Formula One in 2019. Gonna be cheering for you this weekend, lad, says Dan. Well, thanks for the note, Dan, and I'm glad you enjoyed the episode. And let's end with this fabulous little story from Martin James. During the 2019 Austin Grand Prix weekend, my brother and I were waiting for our table in a steakhouse. Esteban walked into the restaurant to get a table for himself, but the wait time was too long. My brother ran after him while I convinced the host to add a chair to our table. And we had a great dinner. Such an amazing and inspirational man. And after hearing about his Australia struggles, now I understand why he was so grateful about our offer. We'll be cheering for him this year. What a story, Martin dinner with Esteban Ocon. It says so much about the man, doesn't it? Well, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from James Key. Make sure you follow Beyond the Grid on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. And if you haven't done so already, why not follow our sister show, F1 Nation, and check out the latest edition from behind the scenes at the Spanish Grand Prix with me and Alex Verts. Thanks for listening. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 and Audioboom Studios. Until next time... Keep it flat out.